Okay, in the last lecture, se lecture segment, you learned some new vocabulary and you learned about the life cycle of land plants. In this segment, we're going to look particularly at the seedless plants, although in this slide we're starting with their relative, which is the green algae. So on the right side of the screen, you can see a picture of a caraphyte plant, or excuse me, a caraphyte algae. And caraphytes are modern organisms, but they're probably very similar to um, what the common ancestor of all the land plants probably was like. So the common ancestor of all land plants is some kind of ancestral algae. And when you think of algae, I think a lot of people think of unicellular organisms, which is what's shown at the top left. Um, but um, the ancestor was multicellular, so more like the seaweed that's shown on the right. So think of seaweed as it is, it's an algae. Um, and it's a multicellular organism. So that's very similar probably to the ancestor. Now we're going to look at the first group of land plants. And these are the first to evolve and the first to live on land. And the group name, the clade name, is called the bryophytes. So the bryophytes are seedless and they're non-vascular. So they do have the alternation of generations life cycle, which all land plants have, but these don't have these other traits. They don't have seeds and they don't have vascular tissue. Because they don't have vascular tissue, that means they cannot move water around inside of their body. So basically the whole plant needs to grow right close to the water so that all the cells can um, get water directly. So they don't get very tall. They're very short, probably, you know, a centimeter at the most in height. And they can grow um, really on rocks. They don't even need soil. They can grow on bricks. They can grow on lava rock, directly on lava rock. So they, they are very um, small plants. And the groups that belong to the bryophytes are called the mosses, the liverworts, and the hornworts. The moss is by far the most common bryophyte, and so we'll use that one as an example in, in the next couple slides. Um, the organisms, these plants are simple. Their anatomy and their physiology is not complicated, but that doesn't mean they're not well adapted to their terrestrial environment. And we still have on Earth 24,000, almost 25,000 species in these three groups, mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. So the bryophytes include all of those 24,000 species. The gametophyte, you remember from the life cycle, the gametophyte in this group of plants, the gametophyte is the main part of the plant. It's the most prevalent part. It's the part when you look at the plant, it's the part you see, it's the green part. And this, there are sporophytes, but they're very small and easy to overlook. So we will look at some pictures. All bryophytes, like I was mentioning before, because there's, um, they must live close to water, they also use water for their sexual reproduction. They don't have seeds. They have sperm, and the sperm have to swim from where they're located to the egg where it's located. And so here I'm adding some new terminology. You may have seen this somewhere else already, but the sperm are formed inside the gametangium that is specifically referred to the antheridium. So gametangium is a general term for any organ that where the gametes form. But if the gametes that form in there are sperm, then specifically we call that gametangium the antheridium. Now the egg also forms in a gametangium 
And the, the specific gametangium that holds the egg is given the name archegonium. So antheridium is the gametangium that contains the sperm. Archegonium is the gametangium that contains the egg. So those are just more specific terms for the, the two types of gametangia. Okay, so here's the picture. Now, the only thing about this is you don't get a sense of scale. But these, these structures are very small. So this is a liverwort. It grows very close to the surface, whether that's a rock or just soil. And these little lobe structures, they look kind of like leaves, um, but they're not leaves. But these little flat lobe structures, they're only about the size of your, your fingernail, you know, on your hand. All right. So something like that. So think about each leaf is about the size of one of your fingernails. So you get a sense they're fairly small. The hornwort here has those leaf-like structures and it also has these little structures that stand upright. And again, these don't get very tall, so you're looking at a close-up. And the, um, these structures that are standing upright are maybe, like I said, maybe a centimeter tall. So we're not talking about very tall. And then this picture here is very close-up where you're seeing these structures that stand up. But this is a, a very close-up picture. This would be a moss, a very, very close-up picture of a moss. So overall, these are, these are small plants. And each one of these, by the way, would be a different plant. So usually bunches of them together. So what we're going to look at using the moss as our example is the life cycle, but we're going to use the script that you learned and you studied in the last lecture segment. And so this is the picture your textbook has. I don't love it, but we can still talk through the script and highlight the terms that apply to us. Um, we're not going to need all the words that are on here. So um, let me get a pen. That's what I need is a pen. Okay. Usually I start with the diploid part of the plant, which is the sporophyte. Now in a moss, each moss plant consists of a leafy structure. It's kind of like this. It's green, and they're showing it here, okay? It's about, like I said, maybe, maybe a centimeter tall. And that part of the moss, a centimeter might be a lot. Some of them, I'll show you some that later on that come from my garden, and they're even shorter than that. But this part is the gametophyte, this part, this green leafy part. So you'll remember in the moss, the gametophyte is the noticeable part, the green part. Now, since moss are, are um, non-vascular, I need to make a comment. This is one of those technical things. And, and in science, we're going to use the terminology correctly, even though in slang, sometimes we don't. So mosses are non-vascular plants. If you use the term leaf, if you use the term stem, if you use the term root, those in science, those only refer to structures that have vascular tissues inside of them, veins. You know, when you look at a leaf, you can see the veins. So because moss is non-vascular, you can't use these terms. You can't say leaf, stem, or root if you're being correct. So we're going to say leaf-like, stem-like, and root-like, because they do have some structures that are look pretty much like a leaf, but since they don't have vascular tissue, we can't use that term if we're being proper. So leafy, leaf-like structures, stem-like structures, root-like structures. And the gametophyte of the moss does have some little root-like structures. If you pull it out of the ground, it'll have some little fibrous-looking material that 
really holds it on to the brick or to the lava rock. But it doesn't go deep down. It's very easy to peel moss off of the surface of the soil because these structures, these root-like structures, don't, don't go deep down. They just kind of grab on to the surface. But in any case, you, usually you have like hundreds of these little gametophytes all packed together. It, it kind of makes a nice green carpet where each gametophyte plant is like one little fiber of the carpet. Um, and then some of the plants will have a sporophyte. And the sporophyte on the moss is just simply this structure. It has this little stem-like portion and it has this portion at the top, which is called the capsule. Um, so that's the sporophyte. So the gametophyte is at the base, and then growing out of the gametophyte is the sporophyte. So we'll talk about why that's the case. But we're going to start with the sporophyte. You remember that the sporophyte contains an organ called the sporangium. The sporangium is this capsule. So the capsule is the sporangium very simplistic, very simple. And you remember inside the sporangium would be the cells called sporocytes. And, in, and the sporocytes go through meiosis and they become spores. So here you're seeing, in this next picture, you're seeing a, the capsule cracks open and the spores are released. So the sporangium contains the sporocytes, which then go through meiosis to become the spores. The spores are then released when the sporangium cracks open. And that's what they're trying to show you here. Each spore then grows into a new gametophyte. And this would be one here. This would be one here. This would be one here a new gametophyte. Now, the gametophyte, once it grows, all right, has, and that's why they put in quotes, stem, leaves, but they put it in quotes because they're not really leaves, they're not really stems, they're not really roots. But these structures here, these small little plants, at the very top, right here in this box that they've highlighted for you, the, um, this red box here and this blue box here. The blue box they have enlarged here and the red box they've enlarged here. All right. And so let's start with, so you have a gametophyte and at the top of it, it contains, within the gametophyte, you'll have an organ called the gametangium in this case, they're showing three of them, three gametangia. But these organs contain the cells that will go through a special mitosis to become the eggs. So these organisms, I mean, these organs are called the archegonia. In the male gametophyte, there contains an organ called the gametangia. Um, and because it's the male, it's the antheridium, is this particular particular name in the male. And that gametangium contains the cells which will go through a special mitosis to become the sperm. So after the special mitosis, the egg is in the gametangium at the top of the female gametophyte. The sperm is in the gametangium at the top of the male gametophyte. So sperm are over here. Eggs, there aren't very many eggs. Lots of sperm, uh, just a few eggs. And then what has to happen is the sperm will leave the antheridium, so this will crack open, and it has to swim, so there has to be water. If there's no water, this can't happen. But when there is water, then the sperm can swim, and it will swim down into the archegonium. And remember, the archegonium is at the top of the female gametophyte plant. And fertilize the egg, so fertilization will happen there. And at that point, the cell that's in there is the fertilized egg is called the zygote. But the zygote is still inside of the archegonium, which is still inside of the female gametophyte. 
and then the zygote will grow into a plant and that when it grows up out of the top of the female gametophyte you see this little stem-like structure in this capsule growing up and that's the next sporophyte. So it's the same script but now you can see the actual like what it actually looks like on on this kind of plant. So the capsule and the and this stem-like structure here that is the whole moss sporophyte and it always grows up out of a female gametophyte because the eggs are located at the top of the female gametophyte in the archegonium and that gets fertilized in that same location. However, you will never have a sporophyte growing up out of a male gametophyte because male gametophytes release their sperm and then the sperm finds the egg in the female gametophyte. So sporophytes only grow up out of female gametophytes. So that is the life cycle. Again, practicing that script is helpful because you've got to know these terms or else none of it makes any sense. All right, a few interesting things about moss other than the life cycle. Um, there is a type of moss called peat moss and the scientific name, the genus name is sphagnum. You can find this at a garden center, you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, and they sell it and you can sprinkle it on your, on your lawn and it actually has, um, it's very acidic so it helps control if you have a fungus infection in your lawn. The other thing that's interesting though about sphagnum is in some parts of the world they grow this peat moss and they um, peel it off of the ground after they grow it and they roll it up and they, it makes like a log and you in some parts of the world where wood is not available and coal and oil they can burn these logs of peat moss it's really just a rolled up um, you know, I said it kind of makes a carpet. You can just kind of peel it and roll it up and dry it and make these little logs of used for fuel. So in some parts of the world, peat moss is burned as a fuel to heat for cooking and so on. It's not bare. I mean, it's just certain parts of the world. Now, what's more interesting to me are, are some what we call bog mummies. Um, they have found... A bog is a swampy place where there's a lot of peat moss. So a very swampy area that's full of peat moss is called a bog. And they have found in bogs, in different places in the world, um, mummies, perfect, well, w very well preserved humans. And this is a, a very famous bog mummy. It's called Tolland Man. You can look it up if you want to know more. Tolland Man, they found this perf well, this very well-preserved human, and he appears to have a rope around his neck. And there, you know, we don't know what happened to him, but they try to figure out based on the clothing and such, you know, try to figure out what happened to this guy as best they can. But um, look how per like fantastic the preservation is of this body. So anyway, if you're interested in Tallinn Man, you can look him up, but I think it's kind of cool. He's not the only bog mummy they've ever found, but it seems that the acidic nature of the sphagnum is, helps to preserve these bodies. Okay, so we looked a little bit at the moss and the bryophytes, and they don't have vascular tissue. All the rest of the groups of plants do have vascular tissue. So just briefly reviewing, xylem is the type of vascular tissue. It's made up of dead cells that are linked together to form one long tube, and it moves all the way through the body of the plant. It's very thin, and they typically, plants have lots of xylem, um, and it moves water. And it typically moves water mainly up from the roots up towards the leaves, up the stem. So it moves by capillary action, it moves water against the force of gravity. 
The phloem consists of living cells that pass sucrose, sugar, glucose, and hormones through the plant, mainly by diffusion. And so one thing that is always true, even for the vascular plants, well, only for the vascular plants, is that only the sporophytes will ever have the vascular tissues. Gametophytes never have vascular tissues. But in the, in the group that are the vascular plants, their sporophytes will have the vascular tissues. So that allows the sporophytes to get taller because they're able to then move the water from the ground up into the taller parts of the plant. So the whole plant doesn't have to be close to the water, just the, the roots. But it, the, the sporophyte can get taller, but the gametophyte stays basically the same size as the gametophyte that we saw with the, um, with the non-vascular plants, with the bryophytes. So a gametophyte is always going to be small. But in the vascular plants, the sporophyte becomes much larger than it was in the bryophyte group. So the main, um, the group that we're going to look at in this chapter are for the vascular plants are the seedless vascular plants because everything in this chapter is seedless. But the, the main, usually the terms we use, we usually say ferns and fern allies. So fern is the, the biggest group of the seedless non-vascular, excuse me, seedless vascular plants. So ferns is kind of our main example in this group. And then you have some things called the fern allies, which means things that are closely related to ferns. So ferns and fern allies. All right, now, the, um, what are the fern allies? Well, uh, I think at the beginning of the chapter we looked at, there was a picture of horsetails, which I told you was related to fern. That was on the very first slide. Um, things called whisk ferns. There's all kinds of things. And there's one called a club moss. And you might think, wow, that's weird because isn't moss in that other group? Um, when, when some of these plants were first found, they were given a name and then it, later on scientists realized it was the wrong classification. And we, um, when something is misnamed, we call it a misnomer. And so even though these plants, the club moss, um, eventually was reclassified into the vascular group, it, the name stuck. So we're still stuck with this name, club moss, but turns out it's in the fern group. So sometimes you have these things that are misnomers in science. So I'm pointing out this particular one. This would be the only one I would expect you to know since I pointed it out. But, um, you know, if you were an expert in, in ferns, you would know which ones are um, misnomers. But club moss is an example of that concept that sometimes something gets named and then once we realize we made a mistake, we don't change the name. So that's true. It's going to be true in the animal kingdom, too. So it can make you a little crazy. Because, for example, fish is an actual specific kind of organism, and starfish is not really a fish. We'll talk about that later. Uh, jellyfish is not really a fish. So um, sometimes these things happen. Okay, but let's just look at some pictures. This is just for, for interest. So the horsetail, I think those pictures were on the first slide of the of the. Of the uh, PowerPoint, and then this is a whisk fern. All right, let's talk about the fern life cycle. You can tell I'm really emphasizing this, this alternation of generations life cycle. I really like this picture better than the one that they had for the moss. The moss life cycle picture was kind of messy to me. But you have, um, on this picture, you have the diploid part of the life cycle up here and the haploid down here. It doesn't matter because it's a cycle. It keeps going. Um, if we start with the sporophyte, the fern sporophyte is the big leafy plant that you would, you know, see. So like a fern, like a house plant, 
you might be familiar with. Underneath, and we can call these leaves because there is vascular tissue, so it does have real leaves. And so under the leaves, there will be the organs, and that's a spelling, sporangia, that should be an A. Um, under the leaves, there will be a whole bunch of organs that hold the cells that will become the spores, and they're located under the leaves. So you have to flip over the leaf of a fern to see the sporangia. Inside the sporangia are the sporocytes. You can't see those here, but inside each of these little dots are tons of little cells. And those are diploid cells called sporocytes. The sporocytes only go through meiosis. Not the sporangia, but the sporocytes go through meiosis. And they become spores, which are haploid. And they're still inside the sporangia, but then the sporangia crack open and release the spores. And the spores then grow into, each spore grows into a new plant, but it's a haploid plant, the gametophyte. And then under the leafy structure of the gametophyte, you have the organs, the archegonia, which holds the cell that forms the egg, the antheridium, which holds the cells that form the sperm. And remember, egg and sperm form by a special mitosis. The sperm have to re be released from the antheridium. They have to swim to the egg. And then the new sporophyte grows up out of that. Because fertilization creates the zygote, but the zygote is still inside of the archegonium of the gametophyte. So the gametophyte, it kind of shows it to you here, but the gametophyte is a little leafy structure. It looks a little bit like a heart. And the archegonium would hold the egg, and when the egg gets fertilized, then the fern grows up out of it. And this is a really bad drawing, but pretend like this is a fern. So each stem, each one stem is one fern. It has lots of leaves, but each stem is one fern plant. Now usually when you have a house plant, you have a pot, and then you have all bunch of them in there, but each one is actually a separate fern plant, if we're getting technical. So, so each of these stems would be one plant. There would be one little gametophyte at the bottom here, and one here. So in this picture, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five different fern plants in one pot. So I know you look at it and you see a whole bunch and you think it's just one plant, but really each stem is separate, is a, so is a separate plant. And these guys do have roots, so they put down real roots. So you have real leaves, real stems, real roots on each of these ferns. So the uh, this is a close-up of underneath the leaves of the fern sporophyte, you have these, these are the sporangia, each one. And in, remember in the moss, we call the sporangium the capsule. In the fern, we call the sporangium the sorus. S-O-R-U-S. Sorus is singular, sori is plural. So all of these structures together, all these sporangia could be also called sori. All right. And each of the each sorus contains lots of spores. So tons and tons of spores. Each spore when released can grow into a new little gametophyte. All right. So just some vocabulary. The sorus contains the sporocytes, and they become the spores after they go through meiosis. Now, when the spore grows into a little gametophyte, like I said, it's a little heart-shaped, leafy-looking structure, the fern gametophyte is, we call it bisexual, which has a particular meaning here. It means 
The archegonia and antheridia are on the same gametophyte. You remember in the moss there was a female gametophyte that had the archegonia and a separate male gametophyte that had the antheridia? In the fern, both of those organs are on the same little gametophyte together. So that's a little bit different. Now, the sperm are still flagellated and they still need to swim to the egg. Now, can the sperm from a gametophyte swim to the egg on the same gametophyte? Sure. Usually you have a bunch of these in a, in a whole mass, so some of them probably sperm fertilize eggs on the same gametophyte, some sperm probably go to other ones, so it doesn't really matter. You get a bunch of ferns that, that grow up out of those gametophytes. Now, how did these structures evolve? Well, you remember in the moss there were already structures that were root-like, stem-like, and leaf-like. So basically what happens in evolution is that the vascular tissue first formed in the part that was stem-like, and so that at that point you have real stems. Then the vascular tissue started moving down into the root-like structures, and then you had real roots. And the very last part of the structure that got vascular tissue was the leaves. So stems, then roots, then leaves. That's the title here. And that whole process happens over from beginning to end. We think it's it took about 40 million years. Um, for that whole process to happen. So vascular tissue appeared, but only in the stems at first. And then oh, gradually over time, it appears in roots and then leaves. Now 40 million years is, it's not, it's not nothing, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of time. It's, uh, you know, 40 million years on your timeline. Um, it's, you know, but it's not, a, it's not a huge amount of time. I mean, it's, it's decent. The, um, if you think about the age of life, life has existed for 3.5 billion years. So what's 40 million? You know, it's, it's, it's a little slice, but not a lot. Okay, so um, it turns out there's only about 11,000 species of ferns on Earth now. Uh, but back in the Paleozoic era, they were much more abundant, and they were, at that time, the most successful group of plants. When the Paleozoic forests, which were made up of mostly ferns, when they died, uh, in swampy areas, they piled up into, um, in layers and became coal and fossil fuels. So in terms of economic value. The ferns today, I wouldn't say the ferns have a huge amount of economic value, but in in terms of the fossilized ferns, there's a huge amount of economic value. Um, we still use fossil fuels even though we should be using other technologies now, but I think you agree that it controls a huge amount of our economy. Um, and so coal and fossil fuels are the main economic product of the ferns, but only the fossilized ones. So live ferns are not a big economic um, product now. All right. Uh, in the next chapter, we're going to look at an, another adaptive trait, which are seeds. Mm -hmm. We do think that the first seed plants appeared towards the end of the Paleozoic. So most of the Paleozoic is dominated by these huge forests of ferns. Even these things that look like trees, they're ferns. All right. And even today, you can find plants that are classified as ferns, and you might refer to them as palm trees. There's various types of trees that are called palm trees. Some of them are actually ferns. Um, palm tree is not really a very a scientific term. It's it's more of a slang term. So some things that you might call a palm tree are actually fern trees. But back in the Paleozoic, they were very abundant, much more so than now. 
But anyway, towards the end of the Paleozoic, that's when seeds first evolved, and that's going to define a new group of plants called the seed plants, which is the focus of chapter 26. In order to really understand the life cycle of the seed plants, we're going to, uh, what I'm going to do is modify the alternation of generations script in a few places. But if you don't know the seedless plant script, then you won't be able to appreciate the changes that I'm making that are particular only to the seed plants. So you need to memorize that alternation of generations script and really know it well so that you can see the differential, the difference in the life cycle of the seed plants, which is the next chapter. So that's my advice. A lot of vocabulary to work on.